here in Nehemiah chapter 5, I first want to give you context so that you understand why we are reading what we're reading. Then what I want to do is give you uh, the context of my own life and why uh, the Lord has rocked me with this text. And so this is the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a woman in exile who has been brought back uh, from Susa to Citadel in Persia, where he is now rebuilding the wall of Israel, the wall of Jerusalem, because the wall represents God's defense of his people. And so for Nehemiah, the point is not the wall. The point is a reminder of God's work with his people Israel in Jerusalem. And so in chapter 4, uh, just to fast forward for you, what has happened is there are people who are coming against the work that Nehemiah has set out to do in the name of the Lord. What ends up happening is they get over that, and here in chapter 5 is the second, what I like to call the second opposition. So the first opposition comes from the outside. The second opposition comes from the inside. So it's not that this is an outside force or an outside enemy, but this is on the inside. You have to understand that the outside forces say, we want you to stop building this wall. Though on the inside, the two things that I have written in my Bible are systemic oppression and capitalism. Now again, please do not think I'm trying at this moment to use scripture to talk about where we are in America. That's not my goal. However, there are things in this text, let me contextualize it for you in my own life. So as a black man in America, if I'm being completely honest, looking at the presidential candidates we have, looking at the hashtag Black Lives Matter, looking at where we are as a country, I've constantly wrestle with, as a proclaimer of the gospel, what is my responsibility? We have gotten away from the prophetic voice. The prophetic voice of scripture is always pointing out when we are outside of God's word and away from God's word. And there are many of us who now care more about acceptance and approval than we do about communicating what God has said. Mm. So as I was reading through Nehemiah, uh, and I see this systemic oppression and this capitalistic nature, I also wrote down in my Bible, Black History, because of what you'll see in just a little bit. So three points tonight that I want to share with you that the Lord shared with me as we go through this text. And point number one is a very simple point. That point is a cry for help. So I want to, again, contextualize this for you. They're working on the wall. As they're working on the wall and working very hard to get the wall completed, they're beginning to recognize we're working for the Lord very hard, but we're beginning to notice that in our private lives, we don't even have enough to sustain ourselves. That's right. So in their private lives, you see it in verse 1, there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their own Jewish brothers, for there were those who said, with our sons and our wives we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. You notice this is not like they saying we want more. they saying we don't even have our basic needs met. Mm. So my wife and I this morning, I can be completely honest with you all, yes? Amen. If I can't, then, then you want to stop me now. <laughs> my wife and I had a conversation this morning. It's amazing in this country. We make elections about two topics generally, abortion and homosexuality, if you're a conservative Christian at all. Uh, and so we got to talking this morning. I said, you know, the issue is, if I'm Satan, what I want people to do is focus on all of these peripheral issues. And what I can do is allow class sizes in America to be 27 kids. It's hard to be a teacher teaching 27 children. But if I'm a teacher trying to teach 27 children, then education is going to be a whole lot harder to get across. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So now you have these children who are potentially less educated, but then you have a whole lot of private people in private schools that are more educated, and this systemic problem just keeps happening over and over and over again. Now, why am I saying that? Because education is a basic need. It's something that should be happening from within families, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's right. But based upon where we are, it's not happening with families. And so if I'm Satan, what am I trying to destroy? God's foundation of all of life. What is that? The family. 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 So if I can destroy the family first, and you notice, even when they're building the wall, he doesn't come to him and say, he comes to him and says, my family is being affected because of the work that we're doing. Not just the work, but this systemic thing that's happening underneath the surface that, that even our own Jewish brothers are capitalizing, taking advantage of us. How are they taking advantage? You see it here in verse 4. There were those who said, we have even borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and on our vineyards. So you see the systemic oppression, both from what's happening with the kingdom, that the king has exacted a tax, that they're now going, man, like, I need the, vine I, there, there's a tax on the vineyard, so now I gotta pay the tax, and my Jewish brother is taking advantage of me, so I gotta take care of that too. Now I don't even have enough money to eat or feed my family because I'm trying to take care of all of these other peripheral things. Mm. And I'm trying to do what God called me to do with building the wall. Mm. So all of a sudden, in one fell swoop, all of these things come together, and you see here a cry for help, verse 5. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children, are as their children, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. 
Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. This is the crazy thing. We live in a world where uh, you don't necessarily hear about human trafficking and the sex slave trade in the presidential debate. You know what I'm saying? But these are things that are happening like over there on two streets down. And we are, let me speak both to both contexts. Within the church, we often are focused on overseas missions. Like, let's all go overseas. But there are people down the street who are hungry, don't that's have food, right. don't have that's jobs. Right. Right. And we act like they're, that, like, that's not where we go. There's another, there, there, there's a part of us that thinks we need to go out and do the work of the Lord versus understanding that the work of the Lord is always in front of you. Jesus said, the poor you'll have off with you always. That's right. But there are many of us, if we can be honest, we bought into the American dream, and so that's what life becomes. It's, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to work really hard, I'm going to get a good job, I'm going to get a house, I'm going to get a wife, I'm going to move out to the suburbs, and we can chill. <laughs> that's the way that we think about it. But I cannot think of anything more anti-gospel. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was talking to one of our staff this summer, and we were talking about moving... Uh, having him move to a place that was local to where we live, and he kind of turned his nose up at it, and uh, he said, well, I don't want to live there. And I said, oh, okay, I got it. Like Jesus wanted to leave heaven and come to earth. Come on. But the reality is there are many of us who think, man, I don't want to live down there. You don't know who's down there. You don't know what's down there. No, the reality is Jesus left heaven. Like if he could leave heaven and grow up in Nazareth, I'm pretty sure we can move to some other place in America. It ain't like you move into some third world country half the time. Now, I get it. There are some places in America even that are like third world countries at times. But I think that we forget as Christians, there's a whole lot of pain that is around us. And there are a whole lot of people crying out for help that we have the opportunity and power to do something about if we get out of this American Christian mindset. Mm. The mindset cannot be, I'm getting out, I'm never going back, I'm going to do it for myself. The mm. mindset has to be, I'm going back into the very place, or should I say, I'm going forward into the very place from which I came in order that they might hear the truth of the gospel. Mm. And more than hear it with their ears, they see it with their lives. Mm. Help me now. With their eyes, they see my life. And so he says, it's amazing to me, just the parallel. We are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. What he's trying to communicate is, man, I recognize that I have this wall to build and this responsibility that the Lord has given me, but I can't even take care of home. Like, I don't think this is okay. It's the Robin Peter to pay Paul. You know what I'm talking about? And so these people are crying out to Nehemiah going, there is a systemic structure set up that's not allowing me to do the work that the God has even called me to do because of all of the brokenness. Nehemiah, can you, as the prophetic voice, speak out against this and do something about it? Mm. Notice verse 6. Verse, uh, the first point is cry for help. Second point is a call to action. Verse 6 says, I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. What I love about Nehemiah, if you ever read the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah always sees, I don't know that Nehemiah has this problem, but Nehemiah gets angry and takes it on as if it's his problem. And the thing I love about Nehemiah is when they come to him and they tell him that Jerusalem is in shambles, let me just read it to you. In chapter 1, when they come to him and give him the report that Jerusalem is in shambles, the Bible says, as soon as I heard this, don't you see the parallel between that and chapter 5? As soon as I heard these words, I sat down, I wept, I mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his covenant, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which yeah. we have sinned against you. Yeah. If I'm going to be completely honest with y'all, that's not often like when i watch the presidential debates my first response was not to mourn and to weep and to cry my first response was to laugh at all the memes on twitter if i'm gonna be completely honest <laughs> but the more and more the more and more i read nehemiah the more and more i begin to understand no this is like this is real this is where we really are this is not a game this is not snl that i'm watching like this is a, a presidential debate which don't look much different than SNL. <laughs> Once I understood that, I began to see Nehemiah's heart because the Lord continues to communicate to me, hey man, I am putting in power whoever ends up getting in power, but I'm doing it in order that my church might rise up and stop playing this church. That's right. Or, or stop playing church is another great way to say it. Yeah. And so here in chapter 5, you see this cry for help that happens first and then a call to action. I love how Nehemiah allows his heart to be pricked by the brokenness that he sees in the world. He does not just go, that's somebody else's problem. Mm -hmm. He doesn't just see a famine 
um, and contextualization today, he doesn't just see a food desert and go, man, somebody need to help them people. Nehemiah gets angry, sees it as his problem. And this is what the word of God says. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. Nehemiah didn't care what people thought about him because that was called action. <laughs> yeah. Now here's the thing you gotta understand. Come on now. Nehemiah is not just doing this because he's angry. And I think if we read the text wrong, we start seeing social justice and we go, Nehemiah was getting it on, like Nehemiah had it. No, Nehemiah understood the nature of the law, which states, do as you would have others do to you, so do to them. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, he understood, love your neighbor as yourself. And so you can see that even in what he says. He says, I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. You are exacting interest, each from his own brother. Then he says, and I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you, have, you, you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. In other words, you now recognize the plight and the systemic oppression, and you're taking advantage of that. You're capitalizing on that. You're capitalizing on the reality that these people don't have enough to take care of basic needs. Nehemiah then wants to do something about it. So in verse 9, he said, uh, or in the verse 8, they were silent and could not find a word to say. Mm -hmm. I wonder what that conversation was like. I wonder if as Nehemiah, as the prophetic voice is communicating to them what is happening, they all went, <coughs> he, he, he's actually right. So like, there, there's nothing we can say. We can't just say, this is a good idea. Like, we know that this is not okay. Nehemiah then says in verse 9, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? This is huge, and this is really the point of the call to action. Nehemiah is not talking about what they have done bad, separated from a standard. I was in line today voting, and I hear two people arguing over who they're going to vote for and what's right and what's wrong. They get to talking about abortion. Finally, one dude says, well, don't you know that the Bible says that God knew you before you were in your mother's womb? And homeboy didn't even listen to that. But then this other lady says, don't you know it's law that if there's an unborn child in a woman's womb and she's pregnant and, and you hit her and they die, you get two counts of manslaughter and not just one? So why the double standard? Dude doesn't say anything. But I was like, it's amazing to me. I was sharing with them in the car. It's amazing to me. That argument didn't turn him around, and the God argument certainly didn't turn him around. But here's the thing you need to know. If there's no standard, Nehemiah is saying what he's saying for no reason. The reason Nehemiah is so moved, the reason we should be moved by what we see is because the standard is, ought you not to walk in the fear of God? Mm. Ought you not to understand that these are people for whom, that God created, mm. for whom Jesus is coming to die? Now, Nehemiah doesn't say that, but we can because we're in New Testament living. But please understand, uh, we're watching ESPN today, um, watching Sports Nation, and it was amazing, talking about the Richard Sherman play last night. And somebody said, you know, kicker, kickers are humans too. Or kickers are people too, is what they say. Kickers are people too. And it's just amazing to me how often when we cross over into sport, it immediately becomes dog eat dog, even for believers. No longer do we think, how is God honored in the display of the attributes that he give, he's given me? We think now, how can I get ahead of everybody else? What is the advantage that I can take? How can I get into this person's brain and pump them into submission? It's just wow. not the way Jesus worked. That's good, y'all. Now, it does not mean you get on the floor, like, there, there's, you know, we were talking and laughing in our room as we watch ESPN, like, there's a difference between cheating and letting them run over you. Like, there's a middle ground. You know what I'm saying? And many of us are not even fighting for the tension of the middle ground. We're just saying, I'm going to go one extreme or the other. What Nehemiah understands is there is a worship, a fear, a reverence for Almighty God in relation to people and taking care of them. Because Nehemiah understands there's only one thing that's going to outlast earth. And you know what that is? People. Ultimately, everybody who dies has a soul. And they're going to spend eternity somewhere, in that's heaven right. or in hell. That's Nehemiah right. gets that. So at the end of the day, these vineyards don't matter because they're going to pass away. And I can tell you right now, sports, at the end of the day, are only used for God's glory and His display in your life. But all of that junk is going to pass. Every single, all your clothes are going to pass. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. For all who love the, the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, will pass, they're not of the Father, they're of the world. And the world will pass away, and the lust thereof. You have to understand, nothing is going to heaven but people. Nothing outlasts earth, earth but people. So that being the case, Nehemiah 
really gets this call to action because he understands this is God's prized possession. As you look at the city of Baltimore, as you look at Coppin State University, I pray to God you're seeing God's like you're seeing God's possession. You're not just looking at random people walking around, but you're going, man, that's a person that God created that he wants to claim as his own. And whether or not they choose to is on them. But you got to understand that that's what life is about. If life is about anything else to you, you're wasting your life. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your talent. Nehemiah says, to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies. Here's the other thing Nehemiah recognizes on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, y'all. Nehemiah is communicating that this is God's people mistreating each other, which is going to make all of the other nations, their enemies, go, well, if y'all can't figure it out, why in the world, like, why would I ever turn to what you call to be truth? Mm. We talk about it all summer with those leaders who come to camp. If Christians can't figure it out, there's a church on every single corner. I know the world is going, why? Like, y'all can't figure it out. We don't split in the club like that, but y'all do that as Christians. How does this work? But we can't unify over all of the essentials we divide over things that don't even matter. That's like right. at the end of the day, right. spiritual gifts is irrelevant to salvation, so it don't matter. Like if we can't be unified on stuff, that's why the world is looking going, why should I believe this? You know how two people, somebody gave a great analogy to some, and I've loved this analogy ever since I've heard it. You know them two people, uh, and you got people like this in neighborhoods, like the neighborhood I grew up, where they fight like cats and dogs in their marriage. You know that they sleep in two different rooms. You know they don't really like each other, but they say they got a good marriage, and you're just like, no. That ain't what, that's, that's not a good marriage. It's almost like if you're single, you go, well, why would I get married if I want that? Never forget, I was in Hyattsville, Maryland at my brother's church standing outside. There was this little girl uh, who, I can't remember how we got on topic, but we were talking about marriage, and she said, I want to get married. I said, why? She said, because I got to get divorced. I said, hold up. What do you mean by I have to get divorced? Because you don't have to get divorced. She said, well, everybody I know is divorced. My mom and dad are divorced. My aunts are divorced. My uncle's divorced. I've never met anybody who's not divorced. I said, well, I'm married. You go to this church, my brother's in there, he's married, so you don't have to get divorced. You know what she told me? She said, it's just a matter of time. Oh, my Lord. But think about it. Her paradigm is, this is going to happen at some point because it happens to everybody. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get her to understand, no, it, it, it doesn't have to happen to everybody. But that's the world that you're living in. So you know what's going to happen? You're going to end up getting married and you're going to end up getting divorced because you think it has to happen. Mm -hmm. If we flip the script and turn it around and go, man, we really can invest all of the weight of who we are in Christ and his kingdom on earth. Life changes. No longer am I thinking, how much money can I make? How much can I invest? I want to save for my retirement. I want to get that 4,000 square foot house, the white picket fence. Like, I want to just go sip on a virgin pina colada and chill. Like, we stop thinking that life. We start thinking, where does God want me to go? What will God use my body to accomplish? Mm. It's good, uh, Last piece is the commitment to change. Here in verse 10, Moreover, <coughs> I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. What I love about Nehemiah is Nehemiah didn't just talk about the problem. He wasn't just a prophetic voice, but he put some feet to that thing. He put his own money behind it. He put food behind it. He said, let us abandon this exacting of, t uh, of interest. So he's not just talking. He's doing something about it. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. So what Nehemiah does is challenges them to live in the fear of God. He's not just giving them a command to follow. He's trying to get them, if you put it in context, to understand, ought you not to fear God? What you should do is take care of them, and this is how you do that. Mm. So if you truly are going to worship the Lord and fear him, mm. here's how you worship the Lord and fear him. He is trying to get them to understand, if you understand God rightly, that will influence your actions. That's right. Amen. We say to camp all the time, anybody can change their actions. Only God can change their heart. But once he changes your heart, I guarantee you, change your, actions. your actions will change. That's right. Have no choice That's right. but for your actions to change. That's right. Notice verse 12, their commitment to change. They said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. Mm -hmm. We will do as you have said. And I called the priest and made them swear to do as they have promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. Mm -hmm. Notice, Nehemiah is not just saying, y'all be good little Jewish people and do this. No, he's connecting their covenant 
to God. No different than a marriage covenant is connected to God. What he's saying is, hey, you can say whatever you want to to me. Like tonight, you can say, yeah, I'm going to go out and I'm going to live this. You can say whatever you want to to me. What Nehemiah says is, you're making a decision in front of Almighty God and he sees everything. So my wife and I, uh, we have six kids. Praise the Lord. I was indeed. indeed. <laughs> um, we were we were down at my um, my parents' house in Southern Virginia. They are redoing their kitchen, and so five of our kids stayed at my parents' house. Our youngest is now five weeks old as of Sunday, and so we had her with us in the in the hotel where we were staying. And so breakfast time, these two ladies, Gugu -goo and Gaga, over my six month old baby because she's just adorable. Not six month old. She looks like a six month old, but she's only six. Five weeks as of Sunday. Anyway, so they goo goo and gaga over her, and they decide they want to bless us because it was our anniversary. They wanted to bless us with a gift card. So um, that afternoon, I walk into the gym to work out, and as I'm working out, these two ladies walk into the gym, and when they walk into the gym, uh, they tell me to stop working out. Long story short, I do. They hand me this card with a $25 gift card in it. I was like, oh, thank you so much. This is awesome. How did y'all know I was in here? And then these ladies look at me and go, oh, he's watching you on the camera. And I was like, hold up, that's, what, what do you mean he's watching me on the camera? So I was freaked out, naturally. These two ladies turn and walk out of the gym. I'm getting her to start working out again. And then I go, hold up, hold up, what have I done for the last? So, like, what camera? So I look up and I see a camera in the corner of the weight room, right? But then as I'm going through the building, I see cameras in a lot of different places. And I'm going, oh, snap, these ladies can see me walk because I don't know where they've seen me. So I'm just thinking, did they see me come down the hallway? Did they see, have I like pulled out a wedgie? Have I been picking my hair? <laughs> what have I done over the last 10 minutes of my life? Um, and I, I immediately thought, man, did I, did I do anything to disgrace Jesus' name? Like, did mm -hmm. I do anything that would make them go, man, this cat said he was a Christian. The next thought that I had was, man, if everybody, every moment could have a camera mm -hmm. into my life, what would they see? Would they be like, man, this dude really knows Jesus, loves Jesus, and he ain't just talking, he's putting feet to it. His own money and his own grain is going into these very things that he's saying that he's committed to. Or would they go, oh, man, this dude is as fake as Angelina Jolie's lips. Like this thing, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was just the first thing that came to mind. Anyway, um, like this dude is not real. It immediately made me think, man, Lord, like I don't want to have a life such that when I think about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, I'm making the most comfortable, easiest Christian decision ever, which is not really a Christian decision. I don't want to be the cat that's like, oh, well, God is calling me to this really hard place, but no, that makes no practical sense, because why would I do that? I told y'all we have six kids. We were pregnant with the sixth one this year, and uh, one of my good friends just came on staff uh, at our camp, and his oldest daughter is the same age as my second daughter. They would have gone into public school together, so we were thinking, man, this is awesome. They'll be in the same grade. They might be in the same class. They'll grow up as friends. They'll both love Jesus. And then God called us to homeschool, right? So naturally, we're going, well, why now? Like, why now? I mean, we have all of these plans for what this is going to look like. And I've already planned out their weddings and how she's going to be her, like, you know, maid of honor. But, but the Lord says homeschool. And so my wife and I kept talking, and she said, well, it just doesn't make any sense. I remember one night I looked at her and I said, sweetie, one, I don't know any Bible story where it made sense. Noah built a boat. What is that? Ain't nobody else got a boat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, uh, Abraham, you're going to have a kid. I mean, the cat's well over 75. You know, like, none of those things make sense. David, fight Goliath. Don't make sense. So I communicated to my wife and I said, I don't think we need to figure out how this makes sense. I think we need to understand that if God is calling us to something, then at the end of the day, whatever he's calling us to is more important than whatever we thought was best. Mm -hmm. So our job is not to figure it out. Our job is just to obey. And as we obey, maybe we'll figure it out. It leads uh, me to another story as we finish this out with commitment to change. So our sixth child, when I found out we were pregnant, immediately the Lord says, charity joy. So I know then we're having a girl. So I tell my wife. I believe that the Lord wants us to name this child Charity Joy. My wife says, how do you know? And I said, because that's the name that I just heard in my head. And I'm pretty sure it's a girl, because I don't think the Lord wants my son getting beat up every day. Like, what makes <laughs> So 
um, my wife tells me she hates that name. And so I'm praying and praying and praying. The guys can tell you in the office, one, my wife and I had contention over it, over contention, contention, contention. At one point I said to Mark, I don't care what we name the child. When she come out, we can call her whatever we want. We can call her Juju B. We can call her whatever we want. But I don't want to be disobedient to the Lord. If he's saying name her Charity Joy, we need to name her Charity Joy, whatever that means. So um, up to two weeks before we had her, my wife walks in one day, sits down at dinner, and announces to our family. I had to, all the guys praying in the office. I was praying, and I said, Lord, you got to do something, because I don't care what the child's name is, but if this is what you want, you got to move my wife's heart. She sits down at the table, and she says, hey, guys, we're going to name her Charity Joy. And I said, what happened? She said, I don't know. I just got a piece. Cool. So we have the child. Get this in your mind's eye. We have the child. We're in the hospital. This is the second day we're in the hospital. I was not there that night. I walk in at like 7.30. The woman who is doing the, um, the, the birth certificate stuff to get the child's name and whatnot walks in as I just sit down once I get there. Okay. Another nurse walks in to take some of Kendra's vitals. A nurse that I had not met. So been there for two days, have seen like five different nurses because they change shifts every 12 hours or whatever. This nurse I had not met, all right? She comes in and she goes, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm going to leave. So then she goes, no, I'll just do it real quick so I won't leave. At that moment, birth certificate lady says, what's the child's name? My wife says, Charity. This nurse who's come to take care of my wife who just said she wasn't going to stay long then goes, that's a beautiful name. I was going to name my child Charity, Ch Charity, because I love that name. That's such a great name. Mm. So then the woman says, what's her middle name? My wife says, Joy. This woman, who's the nurse taking care of my wife, screeches and goes, that was the exact name I was going to name my child. Now, when I said it to my wife, I pointed to my wife, and I was like, there you go. So the, the person lady looks at me and goes, what, you must have come up with that name. I said, no, ma'am, the Lord named my child before uh, yeah. I, I knew what even sex she was. I didn't know, I just knew that's what the Lord wanted to name her. Amen. It. So my wife and I come home and my wife said, well, that could have been a coincidence. I said, come on, Kendra, come on. <laughs> come on. Out of all the nurses we saw, that could have happened when I wasn't there. I, I missed the whole night. How come it didn't happen at night? The lady could have come in at any time. If you tell me they came in at the same time, this lady wouldn't even stay in the room. She said she was going to leave the room. She stayed in the room. Come on, Charity Joy. I've never met a Charity Joy in my life. You telling me this white lady in southwestern uh, Pennsylvania is naming her daughter Charity Joy? I mean, we could have had this baby at any time. It was a great confirmation for me, but the reason I'm saying all of that is the Lord reminded me it don't even make sense. Yeah. Obedience comes first. And there are people that I'm sure could go, Wait a second, you telling me to give them all this stuff back? Man, you don't know how much money and time and energy I put into some of these vineyards. You telling me just to give it back? That doesn't make sense. Nehemiah's point is the fear of God, not what we want. The last part of the text, which is really cool. He says, and all the assembly said amen, and they praised the Lord, and the people did just as they promised. My challenge to you, my challenge to me is, do I have the same call to action and commitment to change that I see in this text? These people were a part of the same type of system we are in America where people are constantly taking advantage of and we constantly take advantage of other things. The question is, am I at that point where I'm no longer doing that because I want to reach out and help and reach in and help? Or am I still trying to always do stuff for me? Jesus said, whoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me daily. Luke 9, 23. Amen. He says in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27, what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? The reality is you're going to give up something. The question is, what are you going to give up? Are you going to live a life where you like, nothing else matters but Jesus, his cross and his kingdom? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to live a life where you go, man, I'm just trying to get all I can on earth? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would remind us that, that you didn't make life easy for the believer. As a matter of fact, you said the complete opposite in this world. John 16, 33, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Overcome the world. Yes. You said, blessed are you when you are persecuted and reviled for my sake. Man speaks all manner of evil against you. For so they persecuted the prophets. Mm. 
Great is your reward in heaven. I pray that you allow us to understand we're trying to live too safe, too clean of a gospel, mm. too cute of a Christianity. 